Hello and welcome to another episode of our Brothers Creed podcast. We're talking about motivation, experiences, and exploring the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers. I'm Ethan. And I'm Jared. And this is episode two, or part two, of the Spy Stories collaboration that we're doing with the Virtuous Men podcast. We had an ex- excellent uh, first part with the first two stories, and this is the, the next two stories uh, in, in our lineup, and these are excellent. Uh, the first two were just... Uh, inspiring to say the least and so uh these next ones you will you will enjoy i promise uh let's go ahead and dive in all right let's do it spartans what is your profession any man who must say i am the king is no true king what i do have are a very particular set of skills skills that make me a nightmare if i can change and you can change Everybody can change! Let us all unite! Let us fight for a new world! A decent world! All right, I think, Jamie, I think you're up next. I'm up next, yep. Um, Yeah, this was, when we were doing Spies, I kind of thought of this time period right away, which is World War II. It's kind of my, my favorite area of history it's i just find it fascinating so many things happened um we all know the story of world war ii but there's so many little stories within it so this is one of those all right here we go it's june 5th 1944 a german private sits nervously in his bunker overlooking the rough seas of the french northeast coast He has been sent here to reinforce the German forces, already preparing for the expected invasion from the Allies, forces who have been massing on the English mainland just 50 miles to the north. In just a few hours, that force will hit the French beaches in mass, and mark the turning point in the war. But this young private won't see any of the action. That's because the Allied landings are actually 250 miles to the west, on the sandy beaches of Normandy. You see, the German high command has been duped, and it's all down to the brilliant work of an unsuspecting Catalan, a man who goes by the code name Garbo. This is a story that is truly stranger than fiction, one of deception, espionage, and small actions that changed the course of modern history. This is the story of Juan Poyol Garcia, World War II's most notorious double agent. Garcia was born in Barcelona in 1912 to a devout Catholic mother and liberal socialist father. He left school at the age of 16 after falling out with a teacher and went to work as an apprentice in a hardware shop. He was conscripted into the army shortly afterwards and served his mandatory six months in the cavalry hating the whole experience. When the Spanish Civil War commenced in 1936, Garcia served first for the Republican Communist forces and then defected to Francisco Franco's Nationalist Fascists. But both he and his family were mistreated by both sides during the war, and the experience left a bitter taste in his mouth for both communism and fascism, and by extension he came to loathe both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Barring some unsuccessful overtures to Hitler from Franco, Spain remained mostly neutral throughout World War II. But Garcia hated Nazism, and seeing its threat to his homeland, wanted to do something, as he put it, for the good of humanity. In January 1941, Britain was the only country standing in the way of Hitler's Third Reich. So Garcia approached the British via the embassy in Madrid. But he was rejected three times, so he sought to make himself a hotter commodity, a double agent. He spent a number of months creating a fake identity for himself, as a fanatically pro-Nazi Spaniard in the fascist Franco-led government. After making contact with an agent from the German intelligence agency Abwehr, he was in. The Germans gave him £600 for expenses, some espionage training, and sent him to London to recruit agents for the German cause. 
but Garcia instead moved to Lisbon, Portugal, and began writing up phony intelligence reports. In 1942, he finally gained the attention of MI5 after the German Navy wasted valuable resources hunting down a convoy of enemy ships that didn't exist. The intelligence had been supplied by Garcia. MI5 sought him out and he moved to England in 1942. Though his first case officer was a complete dud, mostly due to him not speaking a word of Spanish, he did make one major contribution. Not liking Garcia's original code name, he recommended his name befit the excellent role player he knew Garcia to be. At the time, the Swedish American actress Greta Garbo was one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, and so Garbo was the name that stuck. For the next two years, Garcia and his new handler, Tomas Harris, wrote over 300 letters to Garcia's German handlers. The Germans were so satisfied and overwhelmed by the amount of intelligence that was provided that they neglected to even attempt to recruit additional assets on the British mainland. The significance of this cannot be overstated. Not all of the intelligence Garcia provided to the Germans was complete rubbish. For instance, just before the British invasion of North Africa, Operation Torch, he sent an urgent message that troop ships in Mediterranean camouflage were leaving port on the River Clyde in Scotland. But British intelligence purposefully delayed the letter until the landings had already taken place. The Germans wrote that they regretted the letter's tardiness, but praised Garcia's spy work. The Germans knew they needed a speedier form of communication, and in 1943 the pair of Garcia and Harris created a fake radio operator to transmit messages. This radio communication needed the most robust hand encryption the Germans possessed, and so they supplied him with it. Garcia in turn supplied it to Harris, who gave it directly to the brilliant minds at work at Bletchley Park, center for British code-breaking efforts. Having both the source text and the text from the German Enigma machine, this played a fundamental role in Alan Turing and his team eventually breaking the Enigma code. By January 1944, the Germans knew they were on the ropes. With American troops massing on the British mainland, Hitler's intelligence officers were signaling that a major Allied invasion of the French North Coast was imminent. Garcia was asked to keep them informed, and he got to work doing just that, but not quite as they had planned. Over the next few months, Garcia played a crucial role in Operation Fortitude, the deception campaign to conceal the real invasion plan, Operation Overlord. Critical to the Allied success was fooling the Germans into believing the invasion was to be across the Strait of Dover and targeting the French port of Calais. It's 3 a.m. on the morning of June 6th, 1944. Garcia sits in his North London home, ready to transmit his most vital message yet to his German handlers. But there is no answer. In fact, there is no answer for another five hours. And by the time the Germans finally respond, the invasion has already begun. Garcia uses this to pass on accurate but now outdated and therefore useless intelligence. He also makes a crucial deceptive transmission. He says that this invasion of the Normandy coast is just a ruse and that the real invasion is set to take place further up the French coast in the coming days. This is transmitted to the German high command, and then to the forces in Calais, who stay put, waiting for the fleet of British and American ships that never come. Three days after D-Day, Garcia transmits another crucial piece of misinformation to the Germans, overstating the number of divisions of American troops situated in Dover who were preparing for the supposed real invasion. This diversion was supported by the aptly named Ghost Army, who provided hundreds of inflatable tanks, personnel carriers, fake planes, and phony radio chatter to further confuse the Germans. The delays in sending German reinforcements to Normandy that this transmission led to was crucial to the Allies succeeding in establishing a beachhead on the Normandy coast. In fact, the Germans kept two armored divisions and 19 infantry divisions about 200,000 men, stationed in Calais all the way until August, two months after D-Day. 
Garcia was awarded the Iron Cross, a military honor dating back to the 19th century by the Fuhrer himself for his services to Nazi Germany. Garcia ironically replied via radio his humble thanks, stating that he was truly unworthy of such an honor. Garcia was almost exposed as a double agent in September of 1944, and he was protected by MI5 and brought out of the limelight. He received an MBE, Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, in November for his services to Great Britain. After the war, Garcia's life didn't take a turn for the normal, but for the surreal. Fearing Nazi reprisals, he traveled to Angola in 1949 and faked his own death from malaria, with a little help from his contacts at MI5. He moved to Venezuela where he remarried and lived out a peaceful life. On the 40th anniversary of D-Day in 1984, he traveled to the beaches of Normandy where he paid his respects to the man who died there. Four years later, he died in Caracas at the age of 76. D-Day and the subsequent two months of fighting to gain the Allied foothold in German-occupied France cost the Allies over 225,000 casualties. But that number would have been much, much higher had Juan Puyol Garcia not followed the inner conviction to do his part in the war effort. His contributions from his brilliance in gaining the trust of the Nazis, to his role in breaking Enigma, to his deception of his German handlers in pulling off the D-Day invasion, make Garbo stand out as one of the most important men in World War II, having never even fired a shot. Excellent. Wow. Pretty interesting. That is quite yeah. a story. I don't think I've ever heard that story. Yeah, the, it's funny. When you when you Google Garbo, the actor comes up. You have to Google Garbo Spy. <laughs> oh, that was really interesting because that's you know he he got his name from her so yeah she's she's a beautiful actress so well of course yeah kind of kind of kind of well, what pops up in Google first. well and and if you're a spy by nature you're supposed to be in the shadows so, <laughs> yeah naturally yeah <laughs> I, I had heard about the kind of the ghost army before and a little bit about, about that story but that's kind of cool how it played into the trickery of of you know garbo kind of giving this false information and I thought it was funny that the Germans kept it. They were like, oh, you know, oh, that was just a little bit too late, but great job. You're doing so good. You know, it's like, it it's like there's this, it, this yeah. consistent pattern of him always being like a day late. Oh, right. sorry. I just missed you. You know, it's like, <laughs> but I'll, good job. Keep, next time. Next time. Yeah. It's I'll, fascinating too. It's like what you were saying, Ethan, it's really fascinating too, how his actions kind of, there was kind of this ripple effect of his work affected Alan Turing's work and then the ghost army's work. And it's interesting, look, especially in World War II, you, these stories tend to have a ripple effect of this seemingly disconnected event had a major impact on this event that had an impact on that event. Like there's this cause and effect all throughout World War II stories and super fascinating. Yeah. Also, you know, yeah, you're, you know, you're a good double agent when the, when the enemy uh, gives you a, like a cro a metal cross <laughs> as an honor for your service. Yeah, it's like a, a big military honor for the Germans. It's from like the 19th century. They've been. It's not just a small, you know, civilian honor. It's a military honor. So it wasn't insignificant that they gave him that. It's just so funny his response. So, oh yeah, I'm not worthy. That's funny. I'm not worthy. <laughs> just send it to me in the mail. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, too, because you never really hear about Spain when you talk about World War II. It seems yeah. that the minute you talk about World War II, there are certain countries that come to mind, but Spain isn't one of them. So it's yeah. nice to hear another side of the story from World War II, you know, knowing that it wasn't just these countries at war. It was the world and yeah. Spain is no different. So fascinating. So did he speak German as well or English or? No, I don't he... believe so. He he spoke he, he spoke a little bit of English, but his yeah, he was mainly in Spanish, and yeah, the Germans must have found someone who who could translate. And a lot of translation happened between his messages. He would send them, you know. Then his handler would obviously through there and uh, encrypt it, and then obviously because they had what they would get from the encryption, because it was you know. Anyone could hear it, but it was encrypted, yeah. so they or intercepted. 
but then they had the original as well, so they could figure it out. Is he just regarded as a major hero in Spain to this day, or is he still largely unknown? Yeah, well, it's it's funny because yeah, Spain they were neutral in World War II, so he's more right. of a hero to the Allies, to you know specifically to the British than than anyone else. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, you would think that Spain would just revere that a guy like that. <laughs> yes, I think Spaniards kind of try to forget that time in history because mm. the rule under Franco was so horrible that you know they had the whole Spanish Civil War and then Franco came in and mm. it was a dictator of the, of the country for decades so mm. not a good time for them yeah I, I, when you said World War II I thought you were going to talk about the uh, the what's that movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise where they oh, tried yeah. to assassinate uh, Adolf Hitler with a suitcase uh, yeah. also another like legendary spy tale I guess you could say yeah, that, that movie is awesome, and it's so anticlimactic, though. <laughs> yeah. You get to the end, they're like, oh, they all just got killed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not like uh, Inglorious Bastards or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, that was really well, good. Um, yeah, yeah, very that was, well that was, done. That was great. I, 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 too, love World War II, and the story that I did was also a World War II story, um, but this was actually kind of like at the very beginning of the war and yours kind of was it was kind of yeah. kind of mid to mid to late um and so it was, it was really interesting to see the the similarities between the two mm-hmm. oh this ought to be good all this right ethan, be good. here we go this is ethan's December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy, a day, according to some, that could have been avoided thanks to the bravery and sacrifice of one man. Dusko Popov was born on July 10th, 1912, to a very wealthy Serbian family. Dusko grew up in a life of luxury, sailing, riding horses, playing water polo and tennis at all of the fancy country clubs. At 16, he went to England for school, where he learned to love a free country. In 1934, he moved to study a doctorate in law at the University of Freiburg in Germany. At this point in Germany, the Nazis were growing in power, but Dusko had little respect for them. He met a friend named Johnny Jebsen, the son of a wealthy German ship owner. Dusko said of the two, We both had intellectual interests, but on the side, we were addicted to sports cars and sporting girls, and we had the money to keep both. The two attended debates at the Foreign Student Club, where Dusko gave some pro democracy speeches that caught the attention of the Gestapo. In late 1937, Dusko was arrested. The interrogation went on for eight days until he was transferred to another German prison likely to be sent to a concentration camp. Luckily, his friend Johnny came to his rescue and raced to Switzerland and called Dusko's father and told him what was happening. Having significant political influence, Dusko's father was able to get him released. He returned to Belgrade, Yugoslavia, to practice law. In 1940, after the war had begun, Johnny calls in the favor. He is now in the shipping business, 
and he desperately needs Dusko's help to obtain a Yugoslavian license to smuggle out German ships past an Allied blockade. Dusko helps and eventually gets the ships out of the port past the blockade. Johnny confides in Dusko and tells him that he is a member of the Abwehr, the German military intelligence. He was opposed to the Nazis, but felt loyalty to Germany. Plus, it allowed him to keep living his luxurious lifestyle. Johnny asked Dusko to help him compile a list of French collaborators that would be sympathetic to Germany if they invaded. Dusko agreed, and a few weeks later, gave the German Abwehr the list. However, he duplicated the list and handed it off to the British government as well. The British were thrilled and told him to keep in touch with the Abwehr and let them know what he finds. Through Johnny, Dusko is connected with the Abwehr commander, who thanked Dusko for the list and asked him for more help. The German intelligence commander needed a man who could roll with the top levels of British society and gather information. He thought that Dusko was just the man for the job. He gave Dusko a few days to decide, and Dusko immediately went to the British government and talked to the chief of MI6, who wanted him to accept the offer from the Abwehr and become a spy for Britain. Out of this opportunity, a double agent was born. Dusko accepted the offer from Germany to be a spy and was given the code name Ivan. At the same time, he was relaying information back to Britain as their spy with the code name Scoot. The Germans instructed Dusko to gather information on the defenses of the English coastline, locations of military sites and bases, and identifying any weaknesses that might exist. Did Johnny know that his friend would betray the Germans and become a double agent? Maybe? Maybe not. But before Dusko left for London, Johnny told him that he could get him some information on Germany's plans to invade England, so he might have had his own plans to double-cross. Dusko traveled to England to set up shop as an undercover Yugoslavian merchant wanting to import British goods. He begins feeding the Germans just enough information to keep them interested. Some things he shares are true, but do no harm. Other things are half-true facts meant to mislead, and some are pure lies that could not be verified. One scheme that Dusko was involved in was dubbed Operation Midas. The Germans were having issues paying their British agents. With MI5's approval, Dusko realized that he could become a middleman and pass along the money by laundering it. This essentially meant that the German Abwehr was directly funding MI5's double agent program. All this, and the Germans even paid Dusko a 10% commission for every transaction. His reputation as Ivan and Scoot were both growing quickly. The Germans then pushed Dusko to try and become a Yugoslavian delegate to the United States and build a spy ring there. The British approved and he was given on loan to the FBI. This is when the triple agent was born. Dusko met with his old friend Johnny who was still a spy for Germany. Johnny had been assigned by Germany to work with the Japanese to gather information for a possible massive naval raid on a Western power. The Germans then gave Dusko a mission to go to Oahu, Hawaii 
and gather information about military facilities and defenses, in particular the naval base at Pearl Harbor. When Dusko landed in the United States, he met with the FBI and told them everything that he knew, including Japanese interest in Pearl Harbor. The FBI wrote a report, but never shared the information. The director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, strongly distrusted Dusko and personally disliked his womanizing lifestyle. Could this information provided by Dusko have prepared the U.S. for the Japanese attack? There is no telling, but what we do know is that the efforts of Dusko Popov had a positive effect on the Allies winning World War II. Dusko continued to feed the Germans false information risking potential torture and death of not only himself, but his entire family. While in London, Dusko met with Ian Fleming, who was a naval intelligence officer at the time. He was so impressed with Dusko that he based his later James Bond novels around Dusko's life. In the early 1980s, years of chain smoking and heavy drinking had taken a toll on Dusko's health. He died in France on August 10, 1981, at age 69. From playboy millionaire living a lifestyle of luxury to international triple agent. Dusko. Dusko Popov lived a life of duty and action. Wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that he was the guy who inspired the whole, uh, the whole 007 thing. I definitely lost it at that part when I heard the 007 music. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could just tell to, you were I could tell you were having fun with the music on this one. Oh yeah. Oh, I I definitely was. Yeah, and, and that's kind of I mean the whole you you look at James Bond and a lot of his characters kind of that womanizing type uh, you know, life of luxury and sports cars and everything else and that all kind of came from the life that this guy lived. <laughs> and so it's kind of cool. It's incredible. Yeah. Very cool. It definitely it definitely highlights too what what you touched on in one of the earlier ones about just how hard that life could be with with shifting loyalties and things like that like betraying friends or family or whatever you know it just it really illuminates how difficult that line of work must be for that reason yeah if you think about it, this guy could basically he's got a license to do whatever he wants he's but he's a spy of the Germans, a spy of the British, and a spy of the Americans, so he can't cross anybody. <laughs> yeah, for real. He's good on, yes. for all fronts, you know? <laughs> Crazy how, how you could keep that, all those balls juggling in your head. Like, three, a triple agent. You got to know so many names. You can't mess up. You can't use the wrong name at the wrong time. That's just incredible. Someone has that capacity in their mind to, to pull that off. Yeah, I, I thought it was crazy. It, wh while he was kind of the the main agent during, uh, or in, in London at that time, and towards the beginning of the war, he had actually built a little bit of like a, a like a triple a spy ring. There, he had the Germans had him recruit two or three other people to be under him as German spies. Well, he did that, but he recruited them from the British spy agencies. And so they were all double agents and the Germans couldn't pay them. So they paid John or they paid Dusko who ended up paying them and taking a massive cut. I mean, he's probably making money hand over fist yeah. Sc yeah. screwing over the Germans <laughs> with their own money. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty brilliant. <laughs> oh yeah. Epic. 
makes you think. Well, you know, I guess if you if you really dig into it, uh, they say that the U.S. purposefully allowed Pearl Harbor to happen so that we would be thrust into the war uh, as an excuse. So maybe Edgar Hoover, who was that? He was the one. Those later the president, right? President, yeah. Or was yeah. as it says in the uh, vacuum guy. The vacuum guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, Home Alone. He says that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so inter- very interesting. Very very cool story. Very great music. I uh, I, I recognize the music in there that uh, from one of the video games that I used to play when I was a kid. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm just I just got to say I'm very impressed that none of us did anyone from the Cold War because that's usually whenever I think of spies I think of that era so yeah. Yeah. I thought okay like these three guys I didn't do one Jamie didn't do one well I Jared couldn't. didn't do one so Ethan must have done the Cold War guy <laughs> I couldn't do the Cold War you, you couldn't know why why cuz I did Oleg Penkovsky oh, for our mini pond yeah, so that's true that would just be too much that's Cold one War. anti-communist too many <laughs> yeah yeah, I kind of had yeah. an anti-communist theme going. Yeah, there for, for that's a while. true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got, you got Tank Man, you got Oleg. Yeah. So yeah, I I thought Ethan is going to be the one. He's he's got the Cold War guy, but no, nope, World War Two. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, yeah, this one was too good to pass up. Yeah. So I congratulations that... to everyone for not doing the really obvious time error for spies. Yeah, good job. <laughs> yeah, we dug deep on this one. That's right. Yes, yeah, I, always. I, I was like, what's something that these other guys won't choose? And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do this one. <laughs> exactly that's the hard part yeah i like the fact that we keep it a secret that's the that's the fun part yeah yeah well i was I like the mystery i was a little worried whenever jamie was like oh mine's from world war ii i was like oh shoot and Uh-oh. then i like i don't know we, we did somebody different yeah it's like <laughs> i know one of these days we're gonna choose the same guy so then we'll have two versions of the same one so <laughs> it could be a really interesting and really awkward moment yeah now we can yeah. fight about who's right yeah, right, there you yeah. go. You're like, it's like, so which one's better? Uh, hmm. We could do like a poll. We could do a social media poll. Right, that, <laughs> that'll go. be our next collab. Who's ed- whose episode is better? Who did the best? Yeah, that's what we should do next time. We should all do the same person and we'll just duke it out as to which one is better. <laughs> It'll just come down to editing. Who spends the most time editing the episode? Yeah, that would that would exactly very, right. Very boring for listeners, probably, but <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, we'd we have we'd have fun with it, but uh, that's about it. Yeah, exactly. I, I will say mine was exactly ten minutes. Thank to you. To the I, second, I saw that, yeah. and I was like, "Oh man, that was." See, it it can be done. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it Scott, can be done. Scott picks on me for being too long winded on our episodes. So. Only because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Scott's like, a, I can get it done in five minutes. Yeah, Brutus, that was probably the shortest thing I've ever done for any of our collabs or ours. Was it six, Def- six it and was a half? it was less than eight minutes long. Yeah. It was hey, the short, pa- shortest thing I've ever done for this project. But powerful. Yes. Right, that's, that's all, the goal. That's all that counts. That's right. all that counts. I'm a, I'm, a big, a I'm a big believer in short, sweet, and to the point. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I think all these were so great. Uh, it's just interesting. You, you think about the effect that one person can have. And in all these situations, these people weren't maybe necessarily like soldiers out of the field. Or really, I mean, in any of these, I don't think. You know, they were just behind the scenes actors that were uh, playing a part and they had a big impact on, well, some of them, uh, on what happened, uh, you know, during that time period. So, yeah. yeah, it really goes to show too, just how important that work is, you know, cause you're not, it's not the sort of work that you will necessarily get recognized for, except for people that already know about it. Like you're not going to be this national figure because your work is by nature secret. So you might not be known for decades if at all. So I guess for that reason alone, it's it seems like the sort of job where you do it for the duty, not for the fame. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it seems like it's like kind of like a lesson for even everyday life. Like there's always something going on in the background. There's always something that you you're not quite seeing. You know, it's not how it, how it looks. You know, so there's always something else that someone else is trying to pull and. Uh, <laughs> It's just funny, like, um, we know all the common, like World War II, for example, we, everyone knows the common World War II story, what happened, but as I was saying, like, before we played mine, there's so much in World War II that you could learn about, you could spend your whole life, and you, there would still be more stories there. Oh, yeah. Totally. I, yeah, I think every, yeah, for sure, I think every conflict is like that, like, there are so many of these little stories that go unnoticed, and yet they, they had an impact. Yeah. 
It just goes to, especially in times of conflict where even the smallest person can change the course of the future. Yeah. Yeah. It, it makes me think of, you know, like, you know, obviously the conflict going on right now in Ukraine. Like I'm sure there's stuff like this going on. There's, there's double agents, there's people oh, yeah. trying to cross double cross the other side and, you know, we'll probably not hear about them for, for decades or, or yeah. more, but I'm sure it's going on, you know? It oh yeah. Is within the war. And the modern era is totally, you know, totally different with technology and everything and right your everything's being monitored and it's just you know it'd be, it would be wild to to see that uh to under, you know and in 20 30 years from now look back oh early 2000s you know what this spy was doing this and that you know yeah but i think most of that we, yeah. we would never even find out about i think a lot of those spies we never find out about yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, and it seems too like with the way technology has changed that it would be a harder job to do because mm-hmm. right. everybody everybody has multiple cameras in their pocket on their phone and, you know, we're basically being watched all the time. So just how do you even do that job anymore? I mean, yeah. I imagine just the ways that the job is done now is so much different than how it was done the way we think of it. But I mean, the essence of it is the same, obviously, but yeah, you just wonder how technology has really changed the nature of spy work. Yeah. With like facial recognition and everything like that. I mean, you could just, yeah, it'd be interesting. What, what was Maybe that? it's just, it's just done via social media now. Exactly. What, what was that Will Smith yeah. movie uh, that came out where he was, it was like a spy movie. It, it was kind of like, you know, the government's after him and they're using satellites to, to try to find him. It, it came out in like the early 2000s. Uh, and oh, real, um, Come on, Scott. You're the movie guy. It wasn't Gemini Man. No, no that one that was recent. No. This was older. Okay. And it was like... Uh, Me, not Men in Black, obviously. No, that would have been a good one. It was, was in that, er- it was in that era. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was like everything oh, was was monitored and he was outside and they were looking at him on the satellite and it was all this kind of stuff. And I was like, man, this is crazy uh, at the time. And then I'm like, now you know, <laughs> we know that it's like 10 times worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah pe- people uh, voluntarily carry a spy camera in their pocket. Oh, yeah. Basically. <laughs> Have them in our homes with Alexa and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> listen, right. to, listen to your family. All Alexa, get info on Ukraine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, well, this has been a great episode, guys. I, I always enjoy uh, doing collabs with you guys because we, we each bring unique stuff to the table. And uh, I, I can tell that each one of us you know, took time to really – uh, put effort into this project and i and i love just hearing these stories of a lot of times you know you may have heard just a little bit of the story but to hear these stories in full and and the way that each one of us uh i, th- I think produced like a, a theatrical masterpiece an audio masterpiece <laughs> right. um it, it was well, uh, that goes without saying yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no it's always it's always fun working with you guys it's it's great yes, getting it getting those multiple perspectives and everything and that we're all kind of yeah like from the beginning like we're all going toward the same goal like we're trying to explore ways to live more virtuous lives and there are you know there's so many ways to go about doing it mm-hmm. that's right yeah so, and i, I want to say that listeners i mean what what would be what does anyone have a good one we should do and then in the future any collabs any anything you'd like to see us tackle um let us know yeah we'd We'd love to get some feedback from the audience and then uh, maybe I'll come to the table with something that the audience wanted us to do. That'd be excellent. Yeah. 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 But I think a cool thing is too, is that we kind of bring four completely different perspectives into what, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a power punch of an episode, you know, or, or two episodes if we break it up and, and uh, I just really, I I have heard positive feedback as well from listeners just to say, Hey, look, this is awesome. So I, I think, uh, there's, there's a lot more that we, we will end up doing together. So, Absolutely. I can't wait for the next one. So for those listeners out there, you can find uh, A Brother's Creed uh, on TikTok and also YouTube and Instagram at a.brothers.creed. Uh, and then Virtuous Men, you guys are on Instagram. I know that, right? We are. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube. We're on uh, all your podcasting, um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. Um, yeah, look us up and follow and, and let us know if there's anything anything you'd love to see us us do. Um, always always open for recommendations. Excellent. Well, it was great to see you guys. And uh, for those listeners out there, let's build that creed together. <laughs>